This is 105.9 The Region, where parents talk and explore practical, proactive, and evidence-based solutions. This is Where Parents Talk with Leanne Castellino. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Where Parents Talk here on 105.9 The Region. I'm Leanne Castellino. Each week, we delve into a specific aspect of parenting through the lens of science, evidence-based research, or the lived experience of our invited guests. On today's show, a look at collaborative and open source parenting and how science is paving the way for those terms to become more of the norm. Our guest is an award-winning journalist, entrepreneur, and author. Rachel Lehman Haupt is a thought leader on reproductive science and its impact on the future of family. In 2012, she decided to become a single mother. Her latest book is called Reconceptions, Modern Relationships, Reproductive Science, and the Unfolding Future of Family. Rachel joins us today from her home outside San Francisco. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Leanne. I guess a fitting place to start with your particular story is to ask you, had you always wanted to be a mom? I had always wanted to be a mom. I was definitely one of those children that liked to play with dolls, and I always loved little children. So I knew that I wanted to be a mom. I saw what joy motherhood brought my own mother, and I knew that being a mom needed to—I needed to integrate it into my life. I always wanted a career, also, and I and I purposely chose a career that had flexibility, so I could also be a mother. So then at what point as you're hearing your biological clock ticking, do you then decide, you know what, maybe I've got to look at other options here. Could you take us through sort of what you were going through at that time? Well, yes. At the time, I had ended a relationship with somebody who was not ready to have children. I never knew whether when he was going to be ready. And I and I. And, and at the time, I was also thinking about moving back to my to San Francisco, where I had gone to graduate school and sort of a perfect storm happened that the relationship just didn't seem to be going forward. And I, um, you know, but I was also on the cusp of, of, of 37 years old and I had, you know, um, recently frozen my eggs. Um, but I, you know, even with frozen eggs, you know, I started thinking about, um, and, and with the prospects of potentially meeting a new, um, mate, I, you know, I thought I don't want to be in a rush to have a baby with somebody just because I want to have a baby. I want to be with somebody as my partner because I love them. And sometimes love takes time to develop and it often doesn't take, you know, coincide with your biological clock. I mean, many people are lucky and have that. I happen to be in circumstances that it didn't work out. So after many conversations with friends and with family members, I decided to put the cart before the horse and try to get pregnant on my own with the idea that, you know, if I did get pregnant, then I would, you know, become a single mom by choice and maybe meet my partner later down the road. Um, I never planned to be alone forever, but it was really a practical decision and a decision that many women are making now. Um, and I think, you know, a smart decision um, because, you know, I was at an age, I mean, I didn't actually get pregnant until I was 40, but I was at an age where I was still able to get pregnant with not too much, um, you know, like having to go through IVF or like having to, you know, use um, donor eggs. So I actually got pregnant, you know, pretty naturally through artificial insemination with um, a biological child, which is what I wanted to do. You talk about speaking to your family, having your eggs frozen. Was there any other type of research that you undertook once you finally decided that this was the path you were going to pursue of becoming a single parent? Well, you know, there is a wonderful organization um, started by a woman in New York City called Single Mothers by Choice. And she started that organization, I think, you know, now almost 50 years ago um, to support exactly women like me who didn't have, you know, a prospective mate or a dad in their future. or Maybe the dad, you know, decided that he didn't want to participate. I think that was the case for her. And um, and so there's actually a huge huge network of women that are part of this organization. And at the time when I started thinking about it, I actually started going to some meetings and getting and get togethers to talk to women about what the experience 
would be like that were also thinking about it or had or had done it. Um, and that was amazing. And so I think really it was just in talking to other women that, um, you know, seeing that they could do it um, really got me, you know, gave me the uh, strength and uh, to take that brave step. And honestly, you know, it was a process. It was not like three meetings. It was a process of a year or so of these meetings and these conversations. And, and even there was a little bit of a mourning period for me around it because I knew that I wasn't going to, um, you know, have a baby a traditional way. I think many women who are married and have partners and are facing infertility may face a similar kind of um, process that they go through where they realize that maybe they're not going to get pregnant through the conventional, you know, having sex route, but they're going to have to use in vitro fertilization or some sort of insemination, depending on what the uh, fertility challenge is. So, you know, I think it's a it's a situation that you un have to understand that it is a process and everybody comes to the process with a different conclusion. But I was super lucky that, you know, I came to the process through the process with the decision to, you know, start trying to get pregnant. I didn't know what the future would hold, but I was very lucky. You chose to conceive your son through donor insemination, and you gave birth to him in 2012 at the age of 40. Why did you choose this particular route to becoming a parent? Because it was the least, um, the least heavy duty in terms of uh, technology. I mean, I, IVF is very expensive. It's not at that point. It was not covered by a lot of companies or health insurance. I didn't, you know, I was a writer, so I didn't really even work for a company that would have had the coverage. Whereas, you know, insemination or, you know, is, is really kind of a very basic coverage on most, most health insurance plans. Um, so, you know, there was, it was, it was really a financial decision. IVF is expensive. Um, and, you know, now we're in a completely different period where like, you know, a lot of Facebook, you know, covers it on their insurance plans. And so does many, so do many other companies now. So I think that, you know, often, um, you know, it takes a little while for culture to catch up with the, you know, the position that, you know, that women are in. But I think that finally, you know, culture and business is catching up and understanding that women are having children later. Uh, you know, we're putting our careers first. We're putting our economic power ahead of our procreative power. I wrote a lot about that in my first book, In Our Own Sweet Time, Unexpected Adventures in Finding Love, Commitment, and Motherhood. Um, and at the end, in actually in that book, wrote about, you know, buying donor sperm when I got was getting my eggs freeze. And it's this book that actually tells the story of the decision I made to have my son. You're listening to Where Parents Talk. I'm Leanne Castellino in conversation with Rachel Lehman Haupt, journalist, author, and a single mother by choice. We are talking about how science is impacting the definition and structure of family. Rachel, for people who may not be familiar with the terminology, could you describe what collaborative reproduction is? So collaborative reproduction is the idea and it and it applies to um you know, many families that are outside of the traditional nuclear family model. So it applies to, you know, women like me, it applies to single dads by choice, it applies to gay families, uh, queer families, LBGTQ+, however you want to call them. Um, but the idea is that in those families, there is a biological um, part that is missing either sperm or egg, or or a uterus, you know, so reproducing bodies sometimes need to borrow or purchase those parts in order to make a child in their family unit. Um, so that's what cl collaborative reproduction is. It was coined by a um, lawyer named John Robertson. Now, in your case, you talk about having gone to your family when you were first contemplating becoming a single mother by choice. I wonder what kind of stigma, if any, did you experience from any other uh, people that you encountered along the way? Well, you know, I actually didn't in, in, encounter very much stigma from my family at all. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I mean, my, you know, I grew up in liberal New York City. So, you know, very open. All You know, we grew up in a culture filled with, you know, gay families, um, gay friends. You know, I didn't think I grew up with too many single moms by choice as role models, but, you know, clearly like divorced families. And and so I, I grew up with a spectrum and my parents, you know, were open and realized that, you know, a child is created out of love. And that was the choice that I was making. And so, um, 
in other circles, yes, I have uh, run into um, surprising stigma um, that, you know, I never expected even, you know, from sort of more uh, people who I thought were very liberal and, you know, kind of spoke liberal in their virtual signals, but often, you know, really ended up, you know, having quite conservative values around family. Um, I remember once, you know, being in a group of women and the, a woman basically admitted to me that she really believed that a child should have a mother and a father. And that made me feel really bad. We talked briefly about how much has changed with respect to reproductive science in the time since you had your son back in 2012. What would you say stands out for you most with respect to reproductive medicine? Well, I mean, I think two things have struck out, stuck out the most. I think there's a social change and that there's also the technological change. Um, <clears throat> the social change is gay marriage is now legal. So it wasn't. And when I um, and now so, it, it, it you know, there's a, the legality of marriage makes, you know, the legality of family um, m- much different, more different. I mean, gay parents have always been having queer parents have always been having fam- ch- children together in a collaborative way. Um, using friends as donors, you know, it's just always kind of been that. But now it's sort of, you know, that it's legitimate and it's a marriage. You know, the, these choices are no longer kind of marginalized choices. They're legitimate choices. So, and I think at the same time, you know, the science has been evolving. I mean, egg freezing, when I froze my eggs, was still considered a, an experimental technology. Um, and now it is, you know, considered, um, you know, right usage by the um, American Society for reproductive medicine. And I think if you look at the statistics around, you know, donor using getting, you know, IVF and using donor eggs, everything has gotten more precise. I think the science has just gotten better. So it's much easier to have a child older, or if you're facing infertility, or you're making choices like me um, now, because the science is just better. Um, the, the statistics are better in terms of their outcomes. Um, the techniques are more advanced. You know, more and more doctors know how to do it or trained in it. Um, I mean, in a way, like you could argue that the reproductive endocrinologist used to sort of be more of a marginalized field. But now, because so many people are using reproductive technology to have their families, they're almost like a kind of central figure in family planning. Um, and I think that, you know, if you spoke to many reproductive endocrinologists, they would agree that they're almost like consultants in people's family planning, like, you know, how to set out in terms of timing, spacing your family, you know, especially because women are having children older. I mean, couples are having children older, I should say, not just women. It's time for a short break here on Where Parents Talk. When we come back, we'll talk about Rachel's new book and the discoveries she made while researching and writing it. Back in a moment. Stay with us. Want to learn more about the show? Email info at whereparentstalk.com. Stick around. Leanne Castellino and Where Parents Talk will be right back on 1059 The Region. Welcome back to Where Parents Talk. Listen live at 1059theregion.com. Here's Leanne Castellino. Welcome back. We are talking about reproductive science and technology and how that is shaping the future of family. Our guest is Rachel Lehman Haupt, single mother by choice and author. Now, your latest book, Reconceptions, Modern Relationships, Reproductive Science and the Unfolding Future of Family. Can you take us through what was the impetus for this work? The impetus for this work is, well, I mean, it goes back. I I, I worked for Wired Magazine um, in the 1990s. I've always been interested in the influence of technology on culture. And then I think my own life circumstances, the fact that I, you know, was very focused on my career as a journalist. I, you know, was uh, dating later uh, than, um, you know, many people in cities are now still like haven't you know, not marrying until like their early 40s, not even starting to have children until their early 40s. I mean, I think there's just a big shift in that direction. So it was really like seeing the shift in my own life and um, that shift in my own life and in so many of the women and men around me. And then at the same time, you know, um, seeing that the availability of this technology. And then I I wanted to, you know, once I had my son, I really wanted to kind of explore what other families that, you know, this technology is allowing and, you know, the new the new cultural norms around these choices. 
So take us through what you went through in terms of researching this book and some of the discoveries that you made that perhaps you yourself found surprising as you put together this book. Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest discoveries that I found was um, I uh, was able to contact and meet many of the uh, mothers that also uh, used the same sperm donor um, and really found out that some of them were actually local to where I lived and some of them were far flung. And we started talking and we started a community and we, you know, our, our kids met each other. And um, I think that that, you know, and they, uh, many of them had been talking and continue to talk for, for since the beginning. And, and, and it's sort of almost like, you know, there's a phrase called allo parenting, which is raising your kids in community. And I would think that that was kind of a modern form of allo parenting, um, which is actually not really that new because we've always, you know, from paleo times raised our kids in community. I mean, I think it takes a village is not a new idea. It's an old idea that was re, you know, brought up by Hillary Clinton, but it's really like, if you look back, like we used to raise our kids in family bands. Um, you know, the idea of the traditional nuclear family is actually a very new concept. Um, and it has its flaws too. Like, just like every other kind of family has its flaws. There's not one better. And I would not say that the traditional nuclear family is the morally superior kind of family. Take us through the moment when you met or discovered other members of your son and your community. It was mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing to see the faces of these children that, um, you know, that were related to my son. And and, you know, no matter where our relationships go now and in the future, you know, I'm just so excited that my son has the opportunity to have these kids in his life, uh, how he wants to have them in his life or not. And, you know, I definitely encourage other parents who um, have gone this route to, you know, be truthful. I don't think it's a good to keep it as a secret. I think, you know, being open, it's increasingly a more common way of having children, you know, in queer families and um, single families. So, uh, it, it, you know, and, and my son, you know, it, it's not, they're not his best friends, but, you know, I think he likes knowing that, that they're around. We'll see how it develops as they get older. And what was his reaction? How old was he when this discovery was made and what was his reaction to it? He was about six when he when we first started meeting with these families. And he was, I mean, I, I don't like to speak for him and I don't love to um, speak about him too much in, in interviews, but cause it's really his own life and his own choices. Um, but you know, he was open to it. He, he, I think the most important thing is that he wanted to understand that this was, you know, a normal thing and there were other kids that were like this and it made him feel recognized. And, you know, he's, he's, um, not the only kid in his school that is, uh, conceived this way either. So I think it's increasingly becoming like a, you know, one one way that people are having children. Let's go back to the book for a second in terms of the research that you undertook. Uh, you talked about some of the discoveries you made in talking to the people in the community. How about with respect to the medical piece, the science? What struck you, if anything, uh, in terms of what you discovered there? There are a lot of people working on the cutting edge of um, collaborative reproduction per se. I mean, there are many new, you know, IVF obviously, you know, is the, an egg freezing or kind of the mainstream, um, uh, tech, uh, science, reproductive sciences that are used, but there are many people working in labs right now that are, you know, trying to push the envelope, um, to create other opportunities for people. I mean, there, are, there are some doctors that are working on, um, something called three parent IVF, which is where you can actually uh, transfer a uh, uh, the mitochondria of one egg uh, of, of one egg into another egg to um, either get rid of disease or to help a woman who is, um, you know, her eggs are no longer viable because of because of age or or other reproductive um, challenges. Um, and you know that it's been it's it's a pretty controversial technology still. Um, it's not it has not been approved by the FDA, but you know there are many people out there working on it to give you know, opportunity for older women and for people with mitochondrial um, genetic 
uh, diseases, the opportunity to have biological children. Um, you know, I think that there are people working on artificial wombs. Um, so, and, and, you know, artificial wombs now, the science of it has really has to do with supporting premature babies um, that cannot make it through, uh, um, you know, a full gestation in, uh, in a pregnant person's, um, uterus, but honestly, um, you know, obviously, and I, and, you know, the, a lot of this is kind of science fiction now, but you can kind of spin out to like the movie Gattaca with the idea that maybe one day this is a way for, you know, somebody that doesn't have a uterus to have a child. Um, and, 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 and so there are technologies that are like that. And, you know, some of it is, you know, gets you spinning out creatively in terms of kind of like science fiction, but then there's also kind of the bioethic ethical aspect of it, which is the idea that, you know, if this does come true, true and down the line, whether it's in 20 or 30 years, we do need to ask the questions about the proper uses of this technology, sort of in the same way we need to ask questions about like, should we have our kids on Instagram? The science has really blown the doors open in terms of the evolving definition of family. So, Rachel, from your perspective, what do you see as some of the pros and cons of that changing definition of family as we move forward? I mean, I think the pros are that families that otherwise, people that otherwise would not have been able to have children are allowed to have children can, or can have children. And I think these families will become increasingly less marginalized. Um, and I think the cons are there are still many kinks that need to be kicked uh, worked out. Um, you know, a lot, there are a lot of problems. I could go into it for hours with the donor sperm and donor egg industry. There's, um, you know, in terms of like, I mean, you know, I don't believe that anonymous sperm donation is should be available anymore. I really think every kid has the right should have the right to know who their parent is and maybe even meet them someday. Um, and, you know, and I think that, you know, for example, with surrogacy, there is and the same goes with donor eggs. Um, and in terms of surrogacy, uh, you know, I think that many surrogates are still so their bodies are pushed too hard by doctors and um and there should be you know standards of care that you know protect them so you know many surrogates will end up with health problems because they've had like they're pushed it's a financial incentive so they've pushed to have many many children um and that's not always so good what would you say to somebody listening to or watching the show who may find themselves in a situation where they have to contemplate non-traditional means to having a child. There's lots of information out there. How can they effectively parse through it to find what is credible? Read my book. Um, but I also think, you know, finding a community that can help them, you know, going to a support group would be super helpful. Um, I don't know how many support groups there are for single dads by choice, but, you know, I actually have a friend who became a single dad by choice with a surrogate and an egg donor and that surrogate and especially the egg don donor is still like his really good friend and is like part of his children's child's life. He's actually now partnered with a woman. He's a character in the book. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really about finding your tribe of people people that are going to support you. Not everyone is always going to support you. Not everyone is always going to be your friend. Rachel, what would you like readers of your book to take away from it? I think it's a good story. I, I, I think they'll enjoy, um, you know, reading this memoir that starts out with me leaving New York City and moving to a, romantically moving to a houseboat in Sausalito, having a baby and the adventures that we go on. Um, I think it'll be really informative in terms of anybody who's thinking about becoming a single parent, but also really informative to so many kinds of families that are looking for ideas around how to create community. I mean, I think one of the things that the pandemic taught us is is, is that we do not like to be isolated. We like to be connected. So I think one, a lot of the lessons that I learned from collaborative parenting can even be apply, applied to traditional nuclear families. Like we just need to raise our children in villages. We are in conversation with Rachel Lehman Haupt, single mother by choice and author of Reconceptions, a book about reproductive science and the future of families. Is there anything that you see out and available today on the subject matter that you wished had been accessible to you 11 or so years ago when you were living through this? 
I wish that it was more covered by health insurance. I mean, I, it was covered by my health insurance, but I don't think that's the case for everybody. I feel like I wish that all fertility was covered by health insurance. I think we're at a point now where, you know, more and more people um, are having children older. So I think, you know, fertility needs to be covered by health insurance, IVF. It should not come out of pocket. I don't think everybody should have the right to have a child. Um, so I wish I wish for that. And I just wish for more social acceptance. Um, I think it shouldn't be a battle to have to explain why you've done that. I mean, they're always going to be the judges, but I do hope that, you know, it's a softer landing for um, single moms by choice that make the choice in the future. Rachel, how would you say the expectations of becoming a parent compared to the reality of having and raising a child on your own? I always want it to be a mom and I love being a mom. It is a pure pleasure. I mean, I'm a writer too, and I have a you know strong career and I love that as well. And it's a hard balance, but um, the, mo- the satisfaction that I get from seeing my son grow up, even in the most challenging times, like, you know, last week was like a tough week with some of something with his friends and, and he got through it. And to see, you know, the pride that I have around, you know, creating a life and a person um, and raising him is like no other satisfaction in the world. How would you characterize your level of optimism about the future of families, given where reproductive technology and medicine seem to be headed? I'm optimistic. I'm nervous because, you know, we had a bad year for reproductive health last year with Roe v. v. Wade being overturned. I think that, um, you know, it, 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 it definitely is, was a message of control over women's bodies. And it's very, very unfortunate. And I think that, you know, some of the bills around personhood, which is the idea that, you know, a, a life starts even when it's conceived in by in vitro fertilization is slightly scary. Um, but, you know, I'm optimistic that uh, we have, we're going to find workarounds and that, you know, women will maintain to have control over their bodies. And I, you know, put what I did in the same category as it's, it's, it's a reproductive choice and women and, you know, should have control over their own reproductive choices. Rachel Lehman Haupt, journalist, author, and single mother by choice. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a really interesting conversation. I loved your questions. And that's it for this edition of Where Parents Talk. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, you can catch the full video version as well as the podcast at whereparentstalk.com. The podcast is also available at 1059theregion.com. I'm Leanne Castellino. Hope you'll join us next time. Sign up for Leanne's parenting newsletter and so much more at whereparentstalk.com. This is Where Parents Talk on 105.9 The Region.